feel free to unmute yourselves and say hi. Wait, I am Hello. Yeah. Hello. I have a new laptop. Oh, nice. I'm not sure how old the other one was, but I know it was quite old. And it was starting to malfunction a bit, so... Yeah, laptops only have like a few good years in them. Then they start to slow down. Hey, look at that, Logan. You've got your name on instead of a number. Cool. What the heck? Why am I on twice? <laughs> Riley. That's so... Yeah, okay. There are two of you. Mm -hmm. okay. I see that. That's crazy. <laughs> I would have thought it was like at least a decade old, but it's only oh, six boy, years old. <laughs> and uh, Dad ended up having to to fix it up, and it did work for a while. It's just kind of uh, slow and, well, for one thing, the internet connection's weird. It's not remotely as strong, so that's why I kept having to use Cladry's iPad. Yeah, now we need strong internet connection. Oh. Wait, so then who's on I the other end of me? That is the question. Wait, your hair? Yeah, I know. I'm gonna go open the window. Well, open the. Yes. It's getting warmer out there, and it's looking beautiful. Really nice. Nice to have some good weather for spring. Definitely a nice day out. Yeah, and by the end of June, we'll have the longest day of the year. It's the um, vernal, no, yeah, spring, summer, summer, summer solstice, thank you. I was going to say vernal equinox, but that already happened. This is the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, which is the exact opposite of the winter solstice, which is the longest night of the year. And uh, yeah, the farther or the closer you get to the poles, the longer your nights and days are when you reach the solstices. Luckily, we're not as bad as Alaska, where you get weeks and weeks of no sun. Or right now, they get weeks and weeks of no night. That's kind of weird, too. All right, it's 12.30, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. And let's go towards, yeah.
code. I hope that's all right. And if you haven't um, logged into the Pear Deck yet, uh, it would be just got to kind of move around your camera because I know my video is all on the uh, right side and that's where the join code is. So you might have to move something around. It's nice to have the video always showing, but sometimes I minimize it so I can see my whole screen. All right. <clears throat> All right, so for those of you who are responding to those pictures, if you just tuned in, these are pictures of kids going back to school in South Korea. Uh, and yeah, you can see they've got, they're taking precautions. This is a very contagious virus and uh, the last thing they want is for kids to catch it, go home and then give it to everybody in their family like we do with the common cold and the flu. All right, so we've got people writing about, and those are Koreans. I don't know if China, China's probably doing the same thing, but somebody said, I think Chinese people are more safe than us. Maybe, but these pictures are, are from South Korea. Um, yeah, somebody said annoying. Yeah, I mean, just like at the grocery store, how you have, you gotta stand here, so you're six feet away from the next person. And then those dividers, at least they're see-through. Can you imagine if it were the ones, I know Mr. Brennan had those privacy things. Imagine if you had to have that all the time. That would be weird. Um, yeah, some of you are like, I don't like it. No thanks. Nice to be able to interact, but also looks confined. Yes, it does. Uh, and one of, the, one of the pictures I didn't put there was their cafeteria where they go to eat is the same way. They've got those dividers, at least they're see-through. So they're trying to eat and be able to talk to each other, but not uh, spread any virus. They've shown uh, <clears throat> what happens when we talk and how much, it's gonna sound kind of gross, but how much spit actually comes out of our mouth when we're just talking. And normally, you know, it's just spit, but if you have a virus uh, that's growing in your body, even if you don't have symptoms, that's what they call asymptomatic, uh, you're still spreading it. So just imagine people are talking, spit's going all over the air, you open your mouth to talk, you're breathing it in. Normally it's, you know, no big deal. But if it's got viruses in there, then you will catch it and get just as sick. Um, now remember, if you are posting in the chat room, keep it on topic. Uh, if you're talking about other stuff, save that for um, some other medium. You guys can talk some other time. And uh, Cohen, I don't know what that means there, but I'm gonna give you a warning. And if you post in the chat room again, I will remove you uh, from this uh, Zoom. You're a guest here, and I'm just gonna ask you to respect everyone who is here because this is our time to do science and not for you to tell people anything. So you got one chance. Tanner, this is your friend. Control him. Yeah, I was being polite, and uh, politeness doesn't always work, does it? but I believe in second chances. So you have one more. All right, so thank you all who uh, responded. I see a lot of great uh, impressions and I'm gonna lock in three, two, and one. So yeah, some of the responses was, you know, some people thought it was interesting, a cool way to stay safe. Some of you thought it was strange. Uh, some of you were like, oh man, that's a bit too much. I mean, COVID-19, it's, it's kind of scary. 
not kind of, it is pretty scary. And it's just weird because you don't know if you're going to be one of the lucky ones who gets it and, and you get over it rather quickly and just feel bad like the flu, or if you're going to be one of those unlucky people who gets it real bad. Um, so this right here, I think that it could work for a while, but not forever. That is the hope. Once they come out with a vaccine, if we can get everyone or enough people vaccinated, we could beat that coronavirus, that COVID-19. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is the goal here. That's what we're trying to get to right now, to a place where we can get enough people immune to it that the virus just can't infect us. So know that there's good stuff. Um, well, we were supposed to have a special guest uh, today, uh, Nancy Osier, uh, the junior high counselor. It's going to be your counselor next year, most likely, was going to join us today. And I don't see her name on here. Uh, Nancy, if you are here under a different name, raise your hand. Nope, doesn't look like she's here. So I'll tell you what. If she joins us late, I will turn it over to her so we can hear what she has to say because uh, I'm, I'm excited to have her join us today and, and kind of get you thinking about next year. But since she's not here, we're going to move on. And yeah, if she comes in, I'll, I'll let her speak. But in the meantime, uh, I want to put you in breakout rooms so you can actually talk to each other and kind of think about what are you looking forward to next year, September? What do you want September to be like? Uh, and before I put you in breakout rooms, I just want to find out how last week went. Did in your breakout room, did everyone get a chance to speak? Did only some of you speak? Maybe only one or maybe none. So take a second there to let me know how last week went. And we'll try it again. Because this gives you a chance to talk to each other and not have a huge group of people. Yeah, we're at 27. So we're at our usual for um, Thursdays at 12.30 Science. We've got six people have responded for them. Some people shared two, hey, in two breakout rooms, everybody got to share. That's fantastic. Whoops. What happened? Sorry about that. Every time I click, it advances to the next slide. All right, so while you're all, um, responding yep one group <laughs> none of us spoke i'm gonna set up let's see we've got 26 participants so if we do five breakout rooms it'll be about five to six people in each room so i'm only going to give you a couple of minutes because four people in their breakout room nobody spoke so feel free to unmute yourself once you're in the breakout room and just talk uh, share about what you're looking forward to next year. If you didn't get to talk last week, what's going well? You know, catch up with whoever you get put with because they, they put you in rooms automatically. So I'm going to create the rooms. And when you see the join room message, so you have to be in Zoom now. So if you were on Pear Deck, remember it said go to Zoom. So you should be back on Zoom. And then check out... Uh, Um, so, yeah. 
Okay, so on, on this next slide, um, I've got uh, these four people. What do you think they have in common? By the way, we're going back to Pear Deck now. So if you're in Zoom and it's full screen, remember you can exit full screen, open up a new tab, go back to the Pear Deck, and uh, you should be seeing what I'm seeing. All right, so we got somebody talking about their noses. No, no, they don't seem big to me. At least three of them look small. The guy's nose is bigger than the uh, females. Let's see, they all have hair. Yeah, that's true. They all look happy. They, they kind of do. Ooh. Somebody's acting. Are they doctors for COVID? Asking, not acting. They all have had corona. Ooh, that's a good guess. Oh, some of you are wondering, what's he getting at? They're all white. They don't have COVID-19. They're all humans. Eh, of course they are, hopefully. Actually, I'm going to hold off on saying anything more. They all look happy. Oh, the two girls at the top look like twins. That's cool. Okay, so you've got some ideas, and they're all great, by the way, and I'm, I'm glad you didn't know the truth because I hope this is shocking. The shocking thing is none of these are real people. Not a single one. Um, this is, I, I got this article on Facebook. Uh, I don't, it wasn't the last meeting, but the meeting before that, when I reviewed the think like a scientist activity and what you learned there, well, it's, it's gotten to the point where fake news is, is worse than ever. So these photos were completely created by an artificial intelligence, an AI. And um, these are what is known as deep fakes. And deep fakes are made by um, artificial intelligences and they can make photos of people that don't exist. And then imagine if they make an identity to go with that person, they make videos. So I think I mentioned a few weeks ago that they can make videos, YouTube videos, of people doing things that they never actually did, that never really happened. And these photos look amazingly real. And yet, they're not. All fake. All right, we got a hand up. Nigel? Uh, you're on. So, last... All of the previous times I've heard you describe deep fakes, you've said that they were video. You've just said, said that they were videos that someone ta tailored to make the person in them say something they didn't. You never said anything about artificial intelligence or just creating them entirely. You said last time you said they just they were just altered. Yes, which is why I'm confused. Well, those are some of the ways they do it, but the other way they do it is using uh, AI. So the AI is how pe some people are making really good, high quality deep fakes. Um, and that just hopefully raises your awareness that everything you see, whether it's a video, uh, a, a website, a blog, a news article, always double check always verify because they're getting better and better at making lies look real. So that was the point of this. I just thought I looked at those pictures and when I first looked at the pictures, I was like, oh, I wonder, you know, my mind, I was running through some of the same things you all came up with. And then when I read that none of them were real, I was like, I looked at them closely and I'm like, they look totally real. I never would have guessed that. Um, so I find that completely, utterly scary, and yet amazing. All right. 
Sorry about that. I keep clicking and it keeps moving ahead. So by now, most of you should be getting your climate change notes done. And those of you that have, um, your notes have been great. I hope you're watching the videos where I, I kind of pause as I show you the Alliance for Climate Education video and talk about it because I really focus on what I want you to learn, just like I would in class. And, and that's what I miss about being in class is watching videos all together and seeing your reactions and pausing it and having a discussion. Well, we can still do that a little bit if you watch uh, my video, or you can watch the video all on your own. So once you finish climate change, it opens up water quality. And that's what I wanna focus on for the rest of our time together today. Uh, because those of you who have water quality, you may have seen, good grief, sorry about that, some of my videos. And uh, this video here, ooh, I got a spider on my, okay, spider, can you get off that? Okay, no, I don't want you in my eye, thank you. <laughs> we got friends. Um, there are these cool, this is a Google Cardboard, and basically, Google sells this for about six or seven bucks, and they have a bunch of different models, but if, if, if you're seeing my video, you can take a smartphone, put it in there, and uh, just hold it up to your eyes, and when you watch a video like this, like the one that I made in 360 degrees, which I did with a camera like this one, this camera attached to an iPhone allows you to shoot 360 degree video. And then when you watch it on YouTube, now if you're just watching it on your computer or on your phone without this, All right. you see my face there, right? May 4th, you don't have to look at my face the whole time. It's kind of embarrassing. So what I'm doing is I'm clicking and dragging. And look, it's like you're walking with me. And if you watch the video with this like I do every year. it's like you're there I have literally the walking by my years. side you can look but all around and see everything back in it's our because oh, this and that looks very different now because they're building the greenhouse the there horn. by the way they have all the parts for the greenhouse they just have to assemble it the coronavirus causing um, so this video is me so, walking down to the creek showing you the path the route we would take showing you the route we would normally down. take so that's, that's uh, this video. I, I recorded myself in 360 degrees, taking you down to the creek um, so you could get a virtual experience of that. And if you get a cool, go, uh, cheap Google Cardboard, you can um, be there with me virtually. Then the next video in the series is me showing you how I got the data for this year. So this was what I did when I went so down to point, the creek, and I did it on May the 4th. Uh, set up their lab quest. This is called a lab quest. I have it upside down. There we go. Uh, lab quest. It's a lab quest too. It's a sensor interface. And so you can go through that video and see uh, how easy it is to collect data with these probes and sensors. Oh my goodness, it's so much easier than the old days. Now the old days are kind of fun for those of you who like chemistry because you had these little vials of chemicals. You would get your water sample and mix in with the chemicals and compare the color to see uh, the different levels. So that was cool. So I attached this is so much easier. So I just wanted, for those of you who haven't unlocked this quest yet, or maybe haven't started watching the videos, I wanted to show you what was there. And if I speed ahead there, this is what the data looks like. Um, you graph it all right there, and it gives you a minimum, a maximum, a mean, which is what we want. We want the average and a standard deviation for those of you who are into statistics. And this is conductivity and temperature, two of the things I measured this year. And I got to say, it's a lot easier to do when there's a whole bunch of us um, doing it by yourself. Not as fun. Got DO and pH. Now that pH number is wrong. Sometimes the sensors glitch out and give you 
uh, data that, that you just know is bad. And you're going to learn what data makes sense and what doesn't uh, when you watch my videos and go through the data yourself. But I've got data on that part of the creek right there going all the way back to 2002. We started this project before 2002, but it was 2002 uh, when I actually started collecting data with, with students and keeping track of it. So that was pretty cool. And then this video here is another 360 degree video from where we here we are at Chimicum Creek. Collect where the we data. Come every year to test the water quality. And see, so you can look up, you can look down. You take when you're going Sorry about the Senate. graffiti, but you know. Uh, put on your VR headset. That's what people do when they go down there. Join me. Look around. Look up and down. Yeah, and if you got a VR headset, uh, I tried to do it on an Oculus Quest, and I couldn't get it to work. Some videos, I guess, don't work uh, on the Oculus Quest. So that was, you know whatever I tried. Um, but there you have it. So there's some some videos there that I want you to make sure you watch so you can still get the learning. Because that's something that Chimicum uh, students have known since, you know, for almost 20 years now. And we have data for the last uh, 18. So if you jot down some notes as I talk for the rest of these slides, you will actually get a head start on the water quality notes. Now, those of you who already did it, you don't have to do it again unless you just want to type yourself some information because when I end today's session, you'll get the takeaway. Remember, a takeaway from Pear Deck is a Google document with all the slides and all your answers. So any notes you take, you're going to get a copy that's going to be in your Google Drive under Shared With Me. So, take some notes. First thing to know about dissolved oxygen is that um, if you understand a little bit of chemistry, most of you know in your head, okay, I've been told water is H2O. It's H2O. That's two hydrogens and one oxygen bonded together. Well, some people have mistakenly thought, if I've got hydrogen and oxygen, then when the fish breathe oxygen out of the water, it's from the O and H2O. Well, that's not true. You can't, a fish swimming through the water with their gills can't break off an oxygen from the H2O. First of all, they'd be left with two hydrogens all by themselves, which that would not be good for the water. Um, and second of all, they can't break it. So then how do they breathe oxygen? They can't breathe it from the air. Any of you who fish know that. You put a fish in the air, they're, uh, 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 they drown in air, just like we drown in water. So believe it or not, the oxygen that fish breathe in the water comes from the air, most of it. Some of it comes from underwater plants that photosynthesize. But what you're looking at here is the molecular structure of H2O. Everywhere you see H, two H's and an O, they're connected to another H2O because they attract each other. But look at these in between them, OO, OO. Those are oxygen molecules. Oxygens hang out in pairs in the air. You breathe it in gets into your blood, your blood takes it to all the cells of your body so you can live. But in the water, the air makes contact with the water and the oxygen dissolves into the water and that's what keeps fish alive. So that's the biggest thing you gotta know about DO is that it comes from the air touching the water, making contact with the water and from underwater plants when they photosynthesize, because remember, what do plants give out when they photosynthesize? Oxygen. And so that can get in the water too. All right. So question marks are not good notes, but if you have questions, write them down, Wesley, and then you can ask me later on Classcraft. But just putting question marks for notes is um, not very effective. Yes, and somebody, uh, Ethan remembered, because you've done this, we measure how much dissolved oxygen there is in the water in how many milligrams of dissolved oxygen per liter of water. 
if you ever buy two liter bottles of soda, half of that is the volume of one liter. And another way to think of it, same thing, different way, is PPM, known as parts per million. And that tells you how many molecules of oxygen there are in a million molecules of H2O. And a million molecules of H2O is like the teeniest, tiniest drop. So it's not huge. All right, and if you didn't finish your notes, don't worry, you can take some more on the next slide. So this slide reviews what I just said. Diffusion from the atmosphere is air making contact with the water. The oxygen dissolves from the air into the water. So does carbon dioxide, spoiler for ocean acidification. But look, photosynthesis on there. That's the other way oxygen gets into water. And then you see that circle for wind cycling. If you think about it, the air is only making contact with the top of the water. So for oxygen to get deeper, it has to get cycled from wave motion and currents. And if you're a lake, wow, you're just getting it from air blowing, wind blowing over the lake. If you're a creek like Chimicum Creek, though, isn't the creek water moving? Yes. So that means moving water gets a lot more DO because it's moving and it's making way more contact with the air. Now this one shows the uh, photosynthesis. And remember photosynthesis is great because all those plants, trees, flowers, the leaves, the green stuff, they're taking that carbon out of the air. And spoiler for those of you who haven't done ocean acidification yet, uh, but you've done climate change, you know, the more carbon we put in the air, the worse. The warmer we're making our planet and the worse the, the climate is getting worldwide. So overall, trees photosynthesizing is great. And now that we have longer days, more photosynthesis is happening, more oxygen in the air and the water. Now this handy dandy uh, chart here gives you an idea of how much dissolved oxygen different types of fish need. Now look at the one at the bottom, bacteria. One to two parts per million or milligrams per liter. Those are the teeniest, tiniest organisms. Remember Ryan from North Olympic Salmon Coalition who shared with you benthic macroinvertebrates? Those cool little bugs that fish eat that are very important and they tell us how healthy our creek is, they only need about one to two milligrams per liters to live, to survive. That's like one molecule of O2 oxygen in a million molecules of H2O, of water. Boggles the mind. Or one milligram in a whole liter. That's all they need. And they're getting to breathe. Of course, as the fish gets bigger, like salmon, salmon need six, about six parts per million or milligrams per liter. So when we measure the water quality in Chimicum Creek, we're looking for salmon and trout six to seven milligrams per liter or parts per million to know that they're gonna thrive and they're not gonna suffer. Because if they have less, we've seen what happens for years at the Hood Canal when uh, dissolved oxygen drops really, really low. I'm talking about two to three milligrams per liter. Fish pop up dead. They literally suffocate in their own water. So that's important to write down for that one. Yeah, the bigger the fish, the more oxygen. And six to seven milligrams per liter is not a huge amount. I just want you to get that. For us, 20% of our air is oxygen. That's what we need to live. They only need six to seven parts per million or milligrams per liter, barely anything. So you don't need oxygen, full oxygen uh, for survival. And if any of you live long enough to look for other planets to live, remember that 20, 21% oxygen, we can survive. Whoa, what happened? Okay, so. Uh, dissolved oxygen and temperature really go well together because what this graph shows you is as the water gets colder, 
that means the temperature gets less. 25 degrees Celsius is about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. In a river, that can hold about eight to nine milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen. That's the most it can hold. That's, that's not great. I mean, it'd be nice to have more, but look what happens as the water gets colder. As you reach zero degrees Celsius, which is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the water can hold almost 15, over 14 milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen. That's a huge difference because now your salmon, they got no problems, they got no worries, and their eggs will be happier. Because salmon eggs, they need the water super cold, about 30, no, oh, less than 40 degrees. It's got to be cold, cold, cold. Now, compare freshwater to seawater. Now we're getting into temperature. Um, seawater has less dissolved oxygen, can hold less than freshwater. You can see there. So the seawater, even at zero degrees, can hold a close to 12, about 11 milligrams per liter at uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And as you see, the water gets warmer, the dissolved oxygen decreases. So why do uh, people plant trees along the edge of Chimicum Creek? That's right. For those of you who were thinking or said out loud, to shade the water and keep the temperature down. Yeah, that's what they found out years ago when they cut down the trees along the creek. Um, they found out that the water was getting so warm, salmon were suffering and they were dying. Uh, so that wasn't good. So every year that we get to go out, this year we didn't get to go out and plant trees, but in seventh grade, hopefully you'll get to, because it's a sixth and seventh grade project. Uh, Sixth graders have been doing it for so long. Trees that sixth graders from Chimicum planted have resulted in colder temperatures along those parts of the creek. So Chimicum students have done their part for our community. We help a lot. Temperature also affects the metabolism of fish. Metabolism is a combination of how much food you need to take in so you can do the things you have to do. Think of it this way, the more food you eat, the more energy you have. The more energy you have, the more you can live to do the things you need to do. So here's what happens. As temperature increases, you get more metabolism. You get more energy, yeah. Think of a snake, when it's cold, they hibernate. They, they have no energy because they get their energy from heat outside their body. So do fish we generate heat inside our body, so we're luckier. Um, but as the temperature gets warmer, fish can metabolize more. But once you reach a, reach a critical point, it's about 40 degrees Celsius, and if the temperature keeps getting warmer, their metabolism drops again, it's too warm. So summer, when the water gets about 67 to 70 degrees, that's at the limit. Um, that's where fish are like, oh, oh, okay, this is getting, this is just right. I can't take it anymore. So when we keep that shade, those cool trees, they have to be native vegetation. We don't want those invasive berry vines or reed canary grass, eh, none of that. Or the scotch broom, those are bad, 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 bad. Get rid of those. Um, then it's good. Then we keep the water temperature cool. Yeah, so fish have the most energy around 40 degrees Celsius. Hotter water is good for long life, as long as it doesn't get too hot. Metabolism, how much energy you depend on to thrive. Yes. All right, I'm seeing some good notes on there. And um, water temperature doesn't just affect dissolved oxygen. Water temperature is actually so important, it affects all the other parameters. And I'm just gonna mention pH uh, in today's lesson. So you can see that pH, I'll get into more detail next week. pH is an amazing thing. If, if you are thinking of studying chemistry, you're gonna love pH because it's very heavy chemistry. Uh, but think of it this way, a pH of seven 
is very neutral. It's like pure water. And as you get below seven, that, that liquid becomes acidic. A battery acid has a pH of about one. It's a super strong acid. If you go above seven, you get what's called alkaline, like alkaline batteries. It's, it's a different type of acid. Uh, and it's also called basic. And this is confusing, but I've got great uh, videos that show you this and you can read about it on the water quality quest. So there's more there, but I wanna get you started for those of you who haven't gotten there yet. Well, what you see here is that water actually becomes more acidic. The pH goes down from seven to less than seven. Remember, more than seven is alkaline. Less than seven is acidic. And look what happens once you get past around 25 degrees Celsius or hotter than 77, if you get into the 80s and 90s, that water is going to become way more acidic. So water temperature affects everything. Bottom line, keeping our creek cool is good. Planting native trees and, and shrubs along the creek is excellent because that's how we keep it uh, cool and that's how we keep it safe. And yeah, for those of you who have that reed canary grass, funny story about that. Farmers way back in the day, I think it was the 1800s, they brought that canary grass over thinking, woo, we're gonna grow this grass here like crazy to feed our cows. Guess what happened? The cows didn't like it. They hated it. They ignored the reed canary grass, but it was invasive. So what was around to um, control its spread? Nothing. So it grew like crazy. It took over and we've got parts of Chimicum Creek with just that reed canary grass. It choked out the good trees and shrubs and it doesn't provide any shade. So cows won't eat it. It doesn't provide shade. It's bad, bad, bad. And that's one thing North Olympic Salmon Coalition does too is they go around getting rid of the reed canary grass and replanting Washington trees and shrubs. I know temperatures super important. So yeah, next week we'll focus more on pH, but just so you know, uh, the pH goes down as the temperature increases. And spoiler for those of you who haven't done ocean acidification, pH also goes down the more carbon dioxide gets absorbed into our oceans. Uh, not a good thing. And I'll also mention turbidity and flow rate. And yeah, if you've been taking notes, you'll get your takeaway and um, you could turn that in, attach it to water quality, and you just got some of your work done right here, right now. Boom. I know. Good stuff, right? So, are you ready for a test? I've got a short quizzes, shorter than the climate change one. This one's just about what I taught you right now, dissolved oxygen and temperature. So you've got a um, thumbs up and you wanna drag it to the yes or the no. Let's see how many people we've got. Ooh, people are moving. I see they're moving. All right, find your spot in five and four, and my fingers are disappearing, and two, and one. So I, there's a lot on the yeses, and we got one, two, three, four on the nos, and one, two, three, they're kind of like all over the place. Um, so I'm going to switch over to the code. Um, for the quizzes, you're standing but uh 
at least you have the satisfaction of knowing you really did get it right. All right, so if you're finishing up the quiz, go ahead and continue whilst I move on. Um, check out my happy dance. I know, I, I had to do that. I'm liking that Snapchat Bitmoji thing. I'm gonna do way more dances, they're so cool. So see, I like to have some fun while I'm making these Pear Decks for you all. Um, speaking of Pear Deck, I see there are two questions on the frequently asked questions for sixth grade. So that's on Google Classroom if you wanna check it. If you have a question, put it on there. And if another sixth grader answers it, yay! And if not, I check it every few days and answer the questions. And uh, if you're interested in getting your own Google Cardboard so you can do some VR experiences with YouTube. Like if you have YouTubers that do 360 videos, you gotta get a cardboard. I mean, look at it, it's all, they've got cheap ones, $8.95, $9, $5.71. And it fits most phones. So if you have a phone, you should be good. Uh, so check with your parents. They got a really cool one here. Couldn't believe how cheap it was. Look at this one. The one that looks like skiing goggles, 11 bucks. Shoot, if I didn't have an Oculus Quest, I'd get one of those. By the way, Oculus Quest is amazing, people. I've been playing so many VR games. I'm having a ball. Um, yeah, if you want to know some good VR games, message me on Classcraft. The one with Darth Vader is so cool, but really short. Really short, but they're cool. How durable is it? Ooh, good question. It's made of cardboard. I've had this one for years, and I just, I've had students use it. I just tell people take care of it. And, um, you know, if you don't squish it or sit on it or step on it, uh, it can last you years. I've got a similar one. When I got the 360 degree camera, it came with this one, which is sturdier plastic, if you can hear that. I mean, not plastic, cardboard. Um, it's very sturdy. So depending on what you get, but yeah, if you look, Google, do a Google search for Google Cardboard and you'll see some cheap ones because, you know, who's got money to spend now? Especially if it's hard for people to find work. So yeah, that's what I have for you today. Thank you for showing up and for staying with us till the end. Many of you made it all the way. Congratulations.